Hello and welcome back to the Scarab Solutions Ancient Art Podcast. In the previous two episodes, we've been having a lot of fun in ancient Egypt. In this episode, we're going to jump forward a little bit and hop the pond on over to Greece. I want us to look at what's probably my favorite piece in the Art Institute of Chicago's collection of ancient Greek ceramics. The Art Institute has a few very beautiful and entertaining objects in its ancient Greek collection, but this one really takes the cake. Nestled in a vitrine among all the grandiose high classical red figure amphoras, craters, kylixes, and stamnoi, we find a cute little riton. A drinking cup. Okay here, let's do it right. <clears throat> this is a mid-fifth century BC Attic red figure riton in the shape of a donkey's head attributed to the very prolific late archaic early classical Athenian vase painter named Duris. To start things off here in our examination of this riton, let's first check out its interesting manufacture technique. It exemplifies three primary methods for crafting ceramics in classical Greece. The neck and the rim of the cup was thrown on a potter's wheel. The body of the vessel, that corresponds to the head and the snout of the donkey, this part was fashioned in a mold, and the ears and handle were shaped by hand. And it's certainly not unique in this way, but it's nonetheless pretty interesting to see all three techniques used on one vessel. We could, of course, go into much further detail on its manufacture, specifically the firing process of black and red figure Greek ceramics, but let's save that whole spiel for a later podcast. The riton is a common type of drinking cup in the shape of an animal's head. This vessel shape stretches far back to the Bronze Age civilizations of ancient Greece, the Minoans and Mycenaeans, the time of heroic mythic warriors of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and even to earlier periods in the civilizations of the ancient Near East. Raita, that's the plural, from different regions come in a variety of shapes and sizes and aren't necessarily restricted to being in the shape of just the heads of animals. They could be the whole front of the animal, the entire animal itself, or even just parts like a, a horn. Raita were uh, also commonly used in rituals for libation offerings. Now, these raita have a small hole in the mouth of the animal's head through which the libation offering pours out onto the offering table or whatever it's meant to pour out onto. This style of raiton that uh, we have here is fairly common to archaic and classical Greece, just the head and neck. And in the case here, there's no hole in the mouth, so the function is clearly meant to hold a beverage instead of letting it pour through. And by beverage, of course, I mean wine. Wine in ancient Greece, however, was a little different from wine nowadays. The Greeks, believe it or not, actually watered down their wine. Not to do so was considered barbaric, literally, as in how the barbarians drank their wine, mostly northern Europeans. And interestingly enough, the word barbarian derives from how the Greeks perceived certain foreign languages to sound. When foreign people spoke, all the Greeks heard was bar 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 bar. Sounds pretty silly and made up, but it's the truth. Now, back to the riton. The one we have here is made out of ceramic, earthenware, specifically terracotta. It was most likely crafted with the intent of being buried in someone's grave, where it's said to have been found, similar to all the other ceramics in the Art Institute's ancient Greek collection. Not all from the same grave, of course. Raita were used in daily life, but by and large the raita crafted for use by the living were made out of precious metals like bronze, silver, and gold. The raiton was not the drinking cup of your average bloke. These vessels were reserved pretty much for the aristocracy of Greek society, be it classical or earlier. These are the goblets used in the heroic feasts by great warriors on the eve of battle, the dinnerware of Achilles, Agamemnon, Menelaus, and Odysseus at the siege of Troy. Of course, that story was late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. 5th century BC Athenian aristocracy didn't regularly engage much in heroic warrior feasts. Instead, 
wealthy Athenian good old boys would get together at dinner parties and drinking engagements to socialize, talk politics and money, and on special occasions maybe say something intelligent. The types of animals rendered in the shape of the riton are also significant. You frequently come across a riton in the shape of a goat, a ram, bull, deer, or horse, and in the example here, a donkey. It's not coincidence that these are the same kinds of animals used as sacrificial victims in Greek religion. See, while engaging in their modern drinking parties, the classical Athenian aristocracy was symbolically participating in those heroic warrior feasts of yore. On the eve of battle, with the great warriors gathered around, a priest offers up a sacrifice to Zeus and whatever other gods are listening, slicing the throat and spilling the warm blood of the goat, ram, etc., whereas here, the Athenian, leisurely sprawled out on his couch, pours the bright red liquid from the throat of the animal and down the hatch, and the thanks is offered up to a different god, Dionysus, the god of wine. Decorating the neck of the vessel, cute, huh? The pottery term neck actually corresponds here with the literal neck of the donkey. Decorating the neck of the vessel, we see a couple of figures. The half-goat, half-man satyr, followers of Dionysus, with his bushy beard, pointy ears, long bristly tail, and a penchant for not wearing pants, because pants would just get in the way of a satyr's other penchant. In hot pursuit of a maenad, female followers of Dionysus that would run off into the woods at night in wild Dionysiac reveries and in packs chase down live deer with their bare hands, rip them apart limb from limb, and consume the hot, raw flesh and blood. The Greeks actually had a word for that. It's called sparagmos. The classical drinking party was nothing nearly as violent, or religious for that matter, but they had a word for that too, the symposium. Now when we think of a symposium, we picture a bunch of professors getting together, reading some less than exhilarating papers, and then having a little wine and cheese. The Greeks skipped the papers, went straight to the wine, and the cheese was optional. The Greek word symposion with an O-N, from which we get the Latin symposium, with the U-M, literally means drinking together. And you're probably thinking, I'm off my rocker, or at least those of you who've heard of Plato's symposium, where Socrates and a bunch of his friends get together on one evening, and each in turn makes a grand speech on what is love and extolling its virtues. But if you look back towards the beginning of the text, you'll see a very different side to their refined symposium. And I quote section 176 A and B from a translation by Alexander Nehemas and Paul Woodruff, Hackett Publishing Company, etc., etc. When dinner was over, they poured a libation to the god, sang a hymn, and, in short, followed the whole ritual. Then they turned their attention to drinking. At that point, Pausanias addressed the group. Well, gentlemen, how can we arrange to drink less tonight? To be honest, I still have a terrible hangover from yesterday, and I could really use a break. I dare say most of you could too, since uh, you were also part of the celebrations, so let's not try to overdo it. Aristophanes replied, Good idea, Pausanias. We gotta make a plan for going easy on the drink tonight. I was over my head last night myself, like the others. So we see, even Socrates' philosophical brood was not impervious to the temptation of drink. 